There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. And now it's time for the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And here's your host, Big Anklevich. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You get nothing. And Rish Outfield. You lose. Good day, sir. All right, tell them Boris sent you. Welcome to the Dunstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Yeah, welcome everybody. It's episode 111. Ooh, hey, happy 111st episode. Oh, yeah, 111st. You don't look a day over 104. Thanks. That's very kind of you. I am one of your hosts, Rich Outfield. And I'm the other host, Big Anklevich. Welcome. Also, uh, R08OT is here. Say hi to the folks, uh, R08OT. Thank you for having me on your wonderful show. It has been far too long since you have acknowledged me. But now that I have this opportunity to speak... Uh, will... Okay, okay, yeah, thanks, OITOT, thanks. Uh, That's quite And enough. also, also Announcer Man's here. No show would be complete without Announcer Man. Yeah, there he is. So... <laughs> Now we've got the cast of characters introduced. We have a story. No. Yes. It's a new thing we're going to try out. Well, why don't you introduce it? All right. Uh, today's story is called All the Cool Monsters at Once by James Allen Gardner. About the author. James Allen Gardner is a Canadian. No. Done. Yeah. I'm bad? sorry. Let's, let's start over. We're not going to have a, a 111th episode. <laughs> He lives in Kitchener, Waterloo, which I believe is in Ontario. He has a bachelor's in math, a master's in applied mathematics from the University of Waterloo. And he's a second degree black sash in Shaolin 5 Animal Kung Fu. You know, my favorite death metal band is Black Sash. Yeah, my favorite Shaolin 5 is the Animal Kung Fu. Sorry. All right, you just stay uh, there and look pretty, and I'll, I'll do the talking. He won. What did he win? He, there was something awesome he won. Uh, James Allen Gardner was a grand prize winner in Writers of the Future contest. Okay. That's something. And he also won an Aurora Award, which I think is just a Canadian award, so there's no respect for that. <laughs> right, I believe our bylaws say we're only allowed to make fun of Canada once per episode, and I've really? already done that. So. Oh, my. I'm going to have to ch change those. He's also been nominated for Nebula and Hugo Awards, so he's got some good stuff. I've always enjoyed everything that I've read from James Allen Gardner. So Well, in. now I have too. Yeah, you're in for a treat. Today's story was uh, also produced by Marshall Latham, who's been a producer on our show before, and he always does excellent work, so uh, you can expect more of Marshall, that. Marshall, Marshall. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, Marshall's gone on to uh, to start his own podcast now, so we'll actually have a promo for that. The journey into... Don't give it away. All the Cool Monsters at Once by James Allen Gardner Ogopogo was the beginning. He rose from Lake Okanagan at dawn on the 1st of May. He was seen by pretty much everyone in Kelowna, B.C. It's hard to miss a bright green water snake who's half the length of a football field. The monster emerged from the lake in City Park, then squiggled onto Highway 97 North, otherwise known as Harvey Street, and slurped straight through the middle of town. Relatively speaking, Ogopogo was well-behaved. He ate a few squirrels that got in the way, and a yappy Pomeranian who didn't know when to shut up but the snake didn't touch any people. He didn't do much property damage either, considering. When you're the size of a railway train and move in snaky curves, it's hard not to sideswipe cars as you slither down a main street. But the monster didn't go out of his way to cause trouble. He was clearly on some schedule and didn't waste time going all Godzilla on the local populace. The people of Kelowna stayed well behaved too. Ogopogo was a city mascot. A tourist attraction, even if most people hadn't believed in him. Besides, 
Back in 1950, someone talked the BC government into protecting Ogopogo under the Provincial Fisheries Act. Sure, that was only a publicity stunt, but it was still illegal to shoot or otherwise endanger the monster. Best to leave the giant snake alone. People stood back and took photos, then scooped up souvenir dollops of slime that fell off the creature as it passed. Within minutes, the photos were on the web and the slime samples were on eBay. The Kelowna office of the RCMP called Vancouver to ask for instructions. Mounties in Vancouver assumed their Kelowna colleagues were playing a joke, but after seeing the monster on somebody's webcam and listening to feverish news reports from the Kelowna TV station, Vancouver RCMP did the sensible thing. They phoned Ottawa and said, this is a federal matter. Hours passed as bureaucrats fought over who did and didn't have to deal with the situation. By the time the smoke cleared, responsibility had been handed to a committee consisting of General Richard C. Briggs, Canadian Armed Forces, Paulette Leblanc, Deputy Minister of State, and a nondescript man from CSIS named Mr. Smith. They were just getting together to discuss Ogopogo when a boatful of pirate ghosts appeared near Oak Island. Oak Island lies off the southern coast of Nova Scotia, just a tiny piece of land, but it holds one of Canada's biggest mysteries. In the middle of the island, someone long ago dug a money pit, a booby-trapped hole that may or may not contain buried treasure. Stories say that a famous pirate, maybe Blackbeard or Captain Kidd, buried tons of stolen loot in the pit. Nobody knows for sure, because no one has ever dug to the bottom. The sea always floods in first, mixing with the soil to form a quicksand that's killed a lot of treasure hunters. Other diggers have been killed in strange accidents, and even in fights over who'll get the gold once it's found. All these deaths have made some people think the treasure is guarded by a curse. Only a few trinkets have ever been recovered, but every few years someone else tries an excavation. Who can resist pirate gold? The island is private property, but sightseers sit in boats offshore and look at the pit with binoculars. Imagine their surprise when they saw a ghostly ship, flying the Jolly Roger, rise out of the hole like a submarine surfacing. The ship righted itself, then sailed across the meadow surrounding the pit, as easily as if the ship were on the sea. When the pirates reached the ocean, they headed west through Mahone Bay. Dozens of boaters saw the ship. They took pictures of its tattered sails and the crew of skeletons walking its deck. Someone phoned the Weekly World News and said the ship was just like Pirates of the Caribbean. The editor of the news was giddy with excitement till he found out the story was true. Sadly, he said, we can't publish the truth. It would set a bad precedent. Instead, they published a piece on Bat Boy marrying a 900-pound woman with Elvis as the best man. The committee of Briggs, LeBlanc, and Smith weren't amused by the sudden appearances of Ogopogo in the west and pirate skeletons in the east. Now Quebec will want monsters too, said Briggs. LeBlanc glared at him. I'm just saying, Briggs told her, this sort of thing always gets out of hand. Alberta will want three monsters. Ontario will want four. Newfoundland will ask for subsidies because it doesn't have any. Mr. Smith cleared his throat. <coughs> <clears throat> Isn't the more serious problem what these monsters want? If it was just Ogopogo, we could probably keep him happy by airdropping a few tons of fish. But what do we do with phantom pirates? Give them phantom pieces of eight? LeBlanc suggested. Hard to come by, Smith replied. And who knows what phantom cannons might do to maritime shipping? The military has real cannons, said General Briggs. We can blast the pirates and bomb Ogopogo. You can't bomb Ogopogo. He's an endangered species, and he's popular. The committee isn't authorized to do anything that would hurt the government in opinion polls. Besides, Tourism BC would scream blue murder. Do you know how much money they make off Ogopogo each year? Ogopogo dolls, Ogopogo postcards, Ogopogo bumper stickers. Tourism BC shouldn't complain. Thousands of people are rushing to see Ogopogo even as we speak. Every hotel from Victoria to Trail will soon be full. If nothing else, every major news service in the world is bound to send reporters. We'll bomb the reporters too! 
That's what I call a win-win scenario. LeBlanc glared at him again. Neither the snake nor the pirates are causing immediate trouble, apart from traffic jams of gawkers trying to get a peek. But I worry about the big picture. What big picture? Why these supernatural creatures are coming out of hiding, and which monster is going to show up next. Next was the sleeping giant near Thunder Bay. He woke. If you thought Ogopogo was big, consider a man made of stone who can be seen from 50 kilometers away. When he got to his feet, a lot of people took notice. On the plus side, he soon waded into Lake Superior. On the minus side, he was big enough that his head stayed above water even with his feet on the bottom of the lake. The giant spent a few minutes washing off the moss he'd acquired since the last ice age, then he clambered out of the water and headed west along the Trans-Canada. In Ottawa, General Briggs growled, We can't take any chances. I say we blast the Wawa Goose before it gets up to. Finally, said LeBlanc, Something I can agree with. All in favor? The first Sasquatch was sighted north of Regina. Tourism BC cried foul. Everyone knows the Sasquatch is native to the Rockies. A Sasquatch in Saskatchewan must be fake. Alberta supported BC until another Sasquatch was sighted in Medicine Hat. Then Travel Alberta told Tourism BC to go pound sand. The Medicine Hat Sasquatch was immediately nominated to represent Alberta in the Senate and invited to be the Grand Marshal of the Calgary Stampede. More Bigfoots showed up all over the West, one riding the ferry from Nanaimo to the mainland, one hitching a ride south from Fort McMurray, a male-female couple crossing University Bridge in Saskatoon, more in Moose Jaw and Brandon and Buffalo Jump. Within a day, you couldn't drive the Trans-Canada anywhere in the prairies without seeing big, hairy men, women, and children trudging eastward, either singly or in packs. Often they had scruffy dogs trailing behind them, and behind the dogs, anthropology professors frantically taking notes. In response to the West's outbreak of Bigfoots, Northern Ontario went wild with Windigos. Kenora, called by some the Windigo capital of the world, had a parade of the shaggy white beasts slouching along 2nd Street South, two dozen of them leaving frozen footprints in their wake. Buildings on either side of the street were quickly covered in ice. Parked cars got buried under snowdrifts two meters deep, which was uncommon for May, though not unprecedented. More Windigos trekked through Sudbury. The intense chill of their bodies opened up cracks in the Big Nickel. Some emerged from the uranium mines outside Elliott Lake. They were just as cold as other Windigos, but had an awesome radioactive glow that made them easy to track by helicopter, even at night. Others were reported in Timmins, White River, and Kapuskasing. Some flying on the wind, some swimming down streams, some surrounded by their own personal blizzards. Considering that Windigos are famous for cannibalism, photographers switched to telephoto lenses and anthropology departments sent grad students instead of professors. But we have no reports of violence, Deputy LeBlanc told Briggs and Smith. Creatures that spread ice and snow aren't popular, but we're talking about northern Ontario. Those people can handle low temperatures. They just lock themselves inside and listen to Shania Twain albums. Briggs said, We could still bomb the monsters, just to be sure. LeBlanc, as usual, glared at him. Does our Air Force even have bombers? Or are you just going to toss sticks of dynamite out of a Hercules? What bothers me, said Smith, is why the Wendigos aren't eating people. Cannibalism is a Wendigo's standard M.O., all our profilers agree. So if legendary cannibals have suddenly changed their ways, why? What's going on? One of the Sasquatches ate a cat in Portage La Prairie. <laughs> Everybody eats cats in Portage La Prairie. Cats are called Manitoba chicken. Eating a cat is not the same as eating people. I'm grateful no human has been hurt, but it makes me worry when a leopard changes its spot. Leopards? We don't have leopards in Canada. Smith said grimly, Not yet. Quebec's first monster was a loup-garou in Chicoutimi. 
At dusk on May 3rd, she was a middle-aged woman drinking coffee at the Tim Hortons in Place Saguenay. Then the full moon rose, and the woman sprouted fur. Her nose grew, her ears turned pointy, and her fingers mutated into claws. Ten more seconds, and she was three meters tall, a giant wolf thing who threw back her head and howled before sprinting off into the night. Shortly afterward, a bunch of goth teenagers showed up and ordered the same kind of coffee. So this woman just turned into a werewolf. A loop garou. The Blanc corrected him. What's the difference? Bill 101. Fair enough. So this woman turned into a loop guru and just ran out of town without hurting anybody? She mauled a few people. One man in particular. Mr. Smith interrupted. CSIS files indicate the man was wearing a Maple Leafs cap. Oh, then forget I mentioned it. But the point still stands. Why didn't she act like a normal werewolf? Lou Garou. Sorry. Why didn't she act like a normal Lou Garou? Why didn't she go on a rampage? Why aren't the Wendigos eating people? Why is Ogopogo simply slithering along the highway as fast as he can go? He's still on the highway. He took 97 North to the Trans-Canada. Now he's heading east. Look at the map. Briggs, LeBlanc, and Smith were sitting in a small command center in the east block of the Parliament buildings. Like any good command center, it had a map on the wall with flag pins stuck into it. Each pin marked the known position of a monster, color-coded according to type. Blue for big things, like Ogopogo and the Sleeping Giant. Red for habitual killers, like the Windigos and the Lugaru. Black for undead, like the pirate ghosts. And green for weird but harmless, like the Sasquatches. The country was beginning to look like a rainbow pincushion. Have you noticed, said Briggs, that everything out west is moving east, and everything in the east is moving west? You think they're trading places? LeBlanc asked. Or meeting in the middle, said Mr. Smith. Right around Winnipeg. What would monsters do in Winnipeg? What does anybody do in Winnipeg? Uh, I'll get back to you. Newfoundland finally got on the board with 50 headless fishermen. Apparently, decapitation is a major occupational hazard in the fisheries. In story after story, someone falls overboard and gets sliced through the propellers before anyone can do anything. Sometimes the body floats and the head sinks. Sometimes the body disappears, but the head gets caught in the nets. One way or another, head and body get separated which is why every village in the province has a story about some poor guy whose body was recovered but whose head was lost, or vice versa. And now on stormy nights, the headless fisherman wanders the shore, waiting for his head to float back to him. Hence, the fifty headless fishermen who appeared in St. John's Harbor and wandered into town. They stank of the sea, they were wet and bloody, and most had been nibbled by fish during their time underwater but they were greeted with cheers and applause. Finally, said someone, the rock's got monsters of its own. Taverns all over the city opened their doors in case the deceased wanted to wet their truncated throats after so long in the deep. But the fishermen just staggered zombie-like through the streets till they reached the Trans-Canada. There they turned west and joined the great supernatural migration toward the center of the country. Maybe it's a protest match, LeBlanc suggested. The monsters plan to put on a political demonstration. Why? Smith asked. Why does anyone in Canada go on protest marches to demand better health care? LeBlanc nodded to herself. Yes, it makes sense. Those headless fishermen obviously need good medical treatment, and the Windicos, they probably only eat human flesh because of some vitamin deficiency. Yes, that must be it. These monsters are coming out of the woodwork as a cry for help. Smith looked at her. You honestly think they're marching for better health care? LeBlanc's face fell. No, but I understand protest marches. I don't understand monsters. Maybe the monsters intend to fight each other, Briggs suggested. They're gathering for a great big battle or a sports tournament, East versus West, English versus French, living versus dead. Maybe they won't choose sides till they actually meet. Ogopogo and the Sleeping Giant will be captains, and they'll take turns choosing players. 
What kind of sport can you play with headless fishermen? Luge! Have no brains is a plus in luge. And bobsledding, too. Maybe the monsters will hold a full Winter Olympics. The loop guru could probably speed skate on her claws. The Sasquatches can play hockey. And those Wendigos are probably tremendous skiers. Skiing? In Winnipeg? In May? Wendigos make their own snow. In Winnipeg, they'll have to make their own hills, too. You never heard of cross country? Stop arguing. LeBlanc told the two men. If we are sure these monsters are heading for Winnipeg, we need to plan for what to do when they all come together. Bomb Winnipeg! Then blame it on the Winnipeg Blue Bombers! LeBlanc buried her face in her hands. In Toronto, hundreds of albino alligators poured up from the sewers. Nobody paid much attention, but you'll see the gators show up in a dozen American TV shows that were filming around the city. Up in Whitehorse, a flaming Sam McGee was seen walking hand-in-hand hand with Hyla, an Inuit ice spirit. Gives new meaning to the phrase, polar opposites. Other Inuit spirits were spotted across the territories, along with half-human walruses, talking polar bears, and seals that never lost their legs. Around Ungava Bay, a flock of 30 million ukpiks, the stuffed toys, not real arctic owls, flew over the region in a gigantic cloud that darkened the sky for hours and left the tundra littered with fluffy droppings. One observer said, They were very, very creepy, but cute. Outside Moncton, people started a vigil at Magnetic Hill. It was, after all, New Brunswick's most famous oddity. No one was sure what kind of monster would show up there. Maybe a giant horseshoe magnet would rise up out of the earth, or the entire hill would sprout legs and walk away. But whatever happened, Magnetic Hill was considered the province's best bet for joining Canada's supernatural shenanigans. As it turned out, however, New Brunswick's first leap into the unexplained was the Coleman Frog, a giant frog on display in a Fredericton museum. Supposedly, the frog was real, grown to a meter and a half wide by daily drinks of buttermilk, but accidentally killed in 1885 and kept on display ever since. Visitors to the museum often remarked how much the frog looked like a not-very-good papier-mâché model, but sometimes life imitates art, doesn't it? On the evening of May 4th, the frog gave a mighty croak, smashed out of its glass display case, and hopped away into the darkness. New Brunswick's Legislative Assembly met in emergency session to discuss if they really wanted the province to be famous for a big fake frog. They decided no. In fact, the legislature embarked on a new tourism campaign announcing that New Brunswick was the one place in Canada that didn't have monsters. Your maritime haven of peace and sanity. Then a giant horseshoe magnet rose out of the earth at Magnetic Hill. It waddled off westward, using the two bottom ends of its horseshoe as legs. The people of PEI have always denied that Anne of Green Gables was a vampire. When others suggest that Anne strongly resembles an unaging demon who's taken the form of a spunky young girl in order to lull victims into a false sense of security, experts from Charlottetown point out that Anne actually did age over the course of several books, and not once was she depicted as lusting for human blood. The province has three dozen lawyers on call 24 hours a day, ready to fly anywhere in the world to sue anyone who even speculates that Anne might have been a loathsome creature of evil whose famous pigtails were actually tentacles that could hold strong men in an unbreakable grip while Anne tore out their throats. So it is mere happenstance that the suspiciously sweet-faced Anne materialized from mist on the front step of Green Gables precisely at midnight on May 4th. We should draw no conclusions from the fact that she immediately pounced on an after-hours tourist and dragged him into the shadows from which he emerged, much paler, a few minutes later. It's only coincidence that a giant red-haired bat with pigtails was seen taking wing from the Green Gables property immediately afterward, flying, of course, westward. Anne didn't appear because she was a monster. She's a legend. There's a difference. On the morning of May 5th, Briggs, LeBlanc, and Smith were all late in getting to their command center, thanks to an outbreak of urban fantasy all around Ottawa. The wild hunt was raging down 417, goblins terrorized motorists on Riverside Drive, and the unseelie court had held some kind of feast in the National Arts Center before trashing the place 
and heading west. The Prime Minister is very displeased, said LeBlanc. Sussex Drive was invaded by fairy black dogs and the PM's lawn is a mess. On the bright side, Rideau Hall got visited by pixies. They did quite a nice job repairing the Governor General's shoes. Don't worry about the fairies, Smith said. Most of them are already moving fast toward Manitoba. The others will presumably leave once they've had their fun. He looked at the others. Anything else to report? The sleeping giant reached Winnipeg. Briggs replied. Then he turned north to a place called Grand Beach Provincial Park. It's on the southwest shore of Lake Winnipeg. The giant has settled down there like he's waiting for something. Sasquatches are in the area, too. And we expect Manipogo to join up with him by late afternoon. Manipogo? Uh, another snaky lake monster. This one's from Lake Manitoba. Pretty much an exact copy of Ogopogo, though Travel Manitoba denies the ripoff. They would, wouldn't they? Although, what if Ogopogo is male and Manipogo is female? If they're getting together to breed... Bomb them. Bomb them now! Ignoring the general, LeBlanc said, We have another problem. The Prime Minister's office has received an official complaint from the American Embassy. They're annoyed that Canada has monsters, but the U.S. doesn't. They say we violated NAFTA. Are there monsters anywhere else in the world? Smith asked. LeBlanc made a face. There have been claims from Loch Ness, Transylvania, the Bermuda Triangle, and several other places that depend on superstitious idiots for tourist dollars. As far as we can tell, though, they're all just hoaxes. People dressed up or pictures faked with Photoshop. Canada is the only country with real, verifiable monsters. So why does the weirdness stop at the Canadian border? Sasquatches, for example. They're supposed to live all over the Rockies, right? So why haven't any shown up in Washington State? Or Oregon? Or California? Maybe because the U.S. Air Force isn't so stingy with bombs. LeBlanc sighed. <sighs> I've spoken with the Prime Minister, and he's prepared to authorize a single bomb to be dropped on the monsters if and when they all assemble at Lake Winnipeg. If and when, it seems they're doing something that threatens the country. But all three of us have to agree the bomb is necessary. Yes! said Briggs, pumping his fist in victory. I'll call Comox and tell him to pull our bomb out of mothballs. All that day, ticket takers at Grand Beach Provincial Park stayed busy with a steady stream of incoming guests. Half were supernatural. The monsters we've already mentioned, plus phantom hitchhikers, platoons of flying witches, numerous dinosaurs that avoided extinction, and a few obscure oddities like the tobacco monster a leafy green beast from Ontario tobacco country that spits stinging juice into the eyes of anyone working in the tobacco harvest. None of these eerie visitors were charged admission. How could a ticket taker stand in front of Ogopogo, or even worse, Anne of Green Gables with a tiny drop of blood on her pinafore, and say, that'll be five dollars, please? Besides, the park raked in oodles of money from non-supernatural guests, people who'd heard Grand Beach was Canada's bizarreness central and who wanted to see the freak show firsthand. They couldn't get close to the monsters. The Windigos sat on the edge of the gathering, blowing sub-zero gale-force winds at unwanted spectators, but people could still stand beside any park road and watch outlandish creatures arrive. Ghosts, woolly mammoths, shape-shifting animals, walking corpses... Hundreds of beasts from Aboriginal tales, some comical, some talkative, some fierce. A few monsters even spent time with the onlookers. Coyote chatted up several good-looking women, and Crow tried to pick spectators' pockets. The Oak Island pirates let children walk the plank for ten bucks a head, provided the price was paid in loonies, which looked enough like gold doubloons to keep the pirates happy. Several witches opened fortune-telling booths, and the Lugaroo agreed to bite a few goths in exchange for raw meat. Everyone had a pleasant day. None of the park goers realized that the Canadian Armed Forces had transported their one and only bomb from Comox to Winnipeg in a rattletrap CC-130. By nightfall, an air crew was only awaiting orders before making a bombing run. Ready any time you give the okay, said Briggs. There's a large civilian presence on the ground, said Mr. Smith. You can't bomb them. 
The monsters have kept their camp separate from spectators. Drop the bomb in the middle of that camp, and we'll get all the beasties without touching anyone else. But not yet, said LeBlanc. The monsters haven't done anything to deserve being bombed. Uh, those pirates were drinking rum in a provincial park, and not in an authorized camping area. We need a better excuse than that. The Sasquatches don't have their dogs on a leash. Not good enough. The fairy lords are hunting without a license. What are they hunting? Uh, other fairy lords. LeBlanc scowled. Fairy lords aren't protected by Manitoba game laws. She stared at the command center's map. All the flag pins were crammed into a tiny region on the shores of Lake Winnipeg. There's an obvious potential for trouble, but we aren't justified in bombing all those creatures unless something truly bad happens. Something truly bad happened. An anthropology grad student who'd been drinking rum with the pirates decided to sneak into the main part of the monster's camp. His intention was to record any folk music the Sasquatches might sing around their cook fires. Twice, the drunken grad student was driven off by Windigo blizzards. The third time, he got in his car and drove into the camp, pressing forward despite furious snowstorms sent by the Windigos to force him back. The car got inside the Windigo defenses, where it was immediately seized by the pull of the giant horseshoe magnet. The grad student jumped from the car as soon as he realized he'd lost control, but the car continued faster and faster toward the magnet until it accidentally sideswiped the flaming Sam McGee. In accordance with urban legend, the car instantly exploded. Neither Sam nor anyone else was injured, but the thunderous burst of flames was seen by military helicopters spying in the night. An explosion in the camp! Briggs cried. The monsters are going on the attack! We don't know that, LeBlanc said. No, Smith agreed. But can we afford to take a chance? Those monsters could kill thousands of innocents under cover of darkness. They could be eating people even as we speak. Human meat is the new Manitoba chicken. We have watchers in the area. Can't they see what's happening? No, the Windigos have spread a blizzard over the entire park. In fact, the Windigos had created the blizzard to put out flames from the explosion. Unfortunately, all of Grand Beach was hidden by the clouds of snow. Briggs, LeBlanc, and Smith had no idea what was happening inside the clouds. As Briggs had suggested, the monsters might be eating all the people camped nearby. In fact, nothing sinister was going on, but the command center in Ottawa didn't know that. We have no choice, said Smith. Better safe than sorry. He and Briggs turned to LeBlanc. She looked unhappy, but she nodded. All right. Drop the bomb. The plane was already in the air. It had been circling the area, waiting for the go-ahead. Now it changed to a course that would pass over the monster's camp in five minutes. On the ground, Sasquatches fought through the blizzard to see if the anthropology student was all right. Headless fishermen did the same for nearby campers caught in the sudden storm. Four minutes. The sleeping giant picked up the student's car and giant magnet, which were now locked magnetically together. The giant yanked the two apart and gently placed the car back into the nearest parking lot. Three minutes. The pirates handed out rum to warm up anyone caught in the blizzard. For those who didn't want liquor, the witches brewed up tea. Two minutes. Ookpik surrounded cold people with their fuzzy bodies like blankets. Anne of Green Gables offered to hug people too, but no one took her up on the invitation. One minute. With the fires now out, the Windigos let their blizzard subside. The skies cleared. The Lugaru, who had superb night vision, pointed up at the approaching plane. Thirty seconds. Then suddenly... UFOs arrived. They came at light speed from all over Canada, from Gander, Shag Harbor, Summerside, Miramichi, from Rimouski, Shawinigan, Deep River, Port Hope, from Falcon Lake, Swift Current, Camrose, and Suffield, from Duncan and Dawson, Yellowknife and Alert. Some had bits of winter wheat clinging to their bottoms after making crop circles. Some had gill nets slung over them and lobster pots dangling below. Some were scraped from where they'd brushed against mountains in Jasper. Others had dents from collisions with the Cape Breton Highlands or bumpy landings on the Canadian Shield. Many were still wet from leaving their underwater lairs, Atlantic, Pacific, Hudson Bay, the Great Lakes. 
all were as bright as the northern lights, as glistening and perfect as an ice surface after the Zamboni. The silver spaceships, now surrounded by a yellow haze like the sun, stopped directly over the assembled monsters. Ogopogo raised his massive head and said to the anthropology student, They're taking us away. It's your world now. Don't go, cried the student. I still have so many questions. I'm sure you do, said Ogopogo. We're made of questions, but not answers. Goodbye. The shores of the lake exploded with light. To this day, witnesses can't agree if the light was like a bomb going off or hundreds of alien transport beams dragging thousands of monsters up into spaceships. But when the light faded, nothing was left behind but people staring into the dark. Epilogue Two years later, something large and green was spotted briefly in Lake Okanagan. Stories sprang up that Ogopogo hadn't really left with the UFOs. At the last moment, he slipped into Lake Winnipeg instead. Cautiously traveling only at night, he'd made his way home. Sasquatches have also been sighted from time to time, and ghosts, and decapitated fishermen waiting for their heads to float in. Maybe those goths who were bitten by the Lugaru now turn into wolves on full moon nights. Or maybe those are all just myths. Author's Note All the Cool Monsters at Once appeared in Myth Spring, edited by Julia E. Zamida and Genevieve Kierens. The stories in Myth Spring were supposed to be based on actual Canadian folklore and legends. Each story is accompanied by an excerpt from some non-fiction text describing the source of the tale. Now, I wasn't originally invited to contribute to Myth Spring. Julie edits lots of anthologies, and she prefers to have different people write for each one. However, she looks upon me as someone she can call on in case of emergencies. And when one of the other writers didn't come through on a Myth Spring story, Julie turned to me. Could I write something based on Canadian myth? With a deadline of 10 days. Oh, sure, why not? So I started writing a ghost story. Two days later, I got an email from Julie saying, Oh, by the way, we've got too many ghost stories, so don't do one of those. So I started a story based on native myths. The next day, Julie wrote to say, oh, we have too many native legends too. And did I mention you have to base your story on something from a reference book? Okay. I went to the library and looked for reference books. I found Mysterious Canada by John Robert Colombo, an encyclopedia of Canadian weirdness. I thumbed through, taking notes on various things I might write about, and suddenly it occurred to me, why not write about all of them? A procession of monsters starting on the east and west coasts, then converging in the middle. It turned into a love story for Canada and for monsters, two of my favorite things in the world. Do you have a uh, cast list for today's story? Oh, do Rich I get to read Outfield? it? I, I do, actually. Let's see. Wilson Fowley was the narrator and did miscellaneous voices. Okay. Uh, somebody named Rish Outfield did General Richard C. Briggs. Okay, that guy sucked. Well, Big Anklevich did Mr. Smith. That guy sucked worse. L. Scribe Harris was Paulette LeBlanc. Ah. Wow, she's been absent for a long time. And uh, Sir Marshall Latham did Ogopogo and the Anthropology Student. Wow. Those two had a conversation. How about that? He had a conversation with himself. It's almost I... like something else I've heard recently. Hmm. How dare you? <laughs> All right, so we are back. That's right. First off, great story. Yeah. It really was great. And just like most of the listeners, I heard it for the very first time just now. Right. Or read it for the first time, if you want to say. This was one that 
I recorded my part without knowing the story. And yeah, Marshall just highlighted the lines for you that he wanted you to read and had you do it. This is one that I accepted without even asking your permission. I just said, screw you, Rish Outfield. I'm in charge. No. I'm the navigator. It's never going to happen again, Mr. Sulu, but tell me how that how, how that came about. Where did you first hear the story? Uh, sorry, where did you first read this story? And, and how is it that we did it on the show? A couple of years ago, uh, James Allen Gardner's story, <coughs> The Ray Gun, A Love Story, was uh, nominated for a Hugo in what I believe was the novelette category. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I was getting all, like, ambitious with our show. And I was thinking, well, Escape Pod does the short story nominees always on their show. So maybe we could just do the novelettes on our show. You know, we could be cool like that. So I went through and I read all the novelettes that uh, had been nominated that year. And that was about as far as I got on that whole idea of doing that. But... In reading the novelettes, I read The Ray Gun, A Love Story, and I was just blown away at how great that story was. I absolutely loved that story. After reading that story, I realized we had to get ourselves a James Allen Gardner story on our show. And so I, I went out and I uh, looked for any story that I could find on the web, and, and this was one of the ones that I came across. And I read it, and I was very pleased, enjoyed myself thoroughly, as I hope our listeners did as they listened to the story. And I thought, yeah, this is one that we got to get. And so I sent him an email right away and I said, hey, can we do this story of yours on our show? And I'm pretty sure that that email went straight to his spam filter because I never heard a word from him at all. <laughs> then one day, like a year later, I thought, you know what? I never heard from that guy. Maybe I ought to try again. So I sent him another email. And this time I made sure that I changed the setting on the email so it wasn't doing the rich text editor thing. Because sometimes I've found that when you do that, like if you just write doonsteve.com, it'll automatically make a link out of that. Uh -huh. And spam filters, when there's links in emails, will automatically send them to the spam folder. So I've, I've learned to avoid that when trying to contact authors. And yeah, once I changed it over, then the email actually made it to him. And he was totally cool. He was like, yeah, sure, that'd be awesome. And so now here we are. Face to face. A couple of silver spoons? We're hoping to find. We're two of a kind. That's as far as we'll go with that. Yeah, I, I recently made an agreement that I wouldn't sing on the show, so... Oh, yeah. I hadn't heard about that. Interesting. Oh, well, I'll talk to you about it after. So if you sing on the show, does that mean your agreement is broken? I don't know. I'm afraid to find out. Maybe you should wait until after a couple weeks from now before you do that again. Will do. Although when this episode comes out, those awards will probably have already passed. It's all right. No big deal. It's an honor to be nominated. <laughs> Together, we're going to find our way. Do, do, do. No singing, please. Ah, you love it. I believe announcer a man is right in this respect. Your singing is subpar. <sighs> and to think that I wanted him on the show to participate today. Hey, well, go in the corner and do your thing. At least he's honest. That and a dollar will buy you a USA Today. Will it? Do they get USA Today in Canada, Big? I don't know. Probably not. They probably have to get some Canada Today type publication. Screw I don't know. Them. You just came back from Canada. I did. Yeah, I had a... Uh... Did you go to any of the locations this story describes? I was close to some of them. I didn't actually... I've been to some of them before. He did mention, uh, for example, Buffalo Jump. Uh, and he also mentioned Medicine Hat. I know well, while we were there, my uh, wife's uh, brother had to uh, run off to Medicine Hat to do a, a job there. And he was there for several a, days. Is that a euphemism? <laughs> it's like his wife has been crying because he's been running off to Medicine Hat, if you know what I mean. <laughs> he was in Medicine Hat for the, uh, the whole week. And that was where several Sasquatches appeared from, if I remember right in the story. But yeah, Buffalo Jump, I couldn't for some reason talk my wife into going. I guess she's been there before. It's Head Smashed In Buffalo Jump is the name of the uh, place. I got nothing. People can't see you gesticulating like that, you know. Sorry. We're going to have to put an explicit warning <laughs> just from the name of that town. I don't know if it's even a town or what it is. From what I've heard from my wife, it's basically a cliff. And uh, it's called Head Smashed In Buffalo Jump because that was how the Indians would hunt the buffaloes is they would basically get on their horses and they would 
get them stampeding until they mm. jumped off of this cliff and then they have themselves some buffalo burgers. Mm. From what I understand, and my wife's just like, no, we're not going. All it is is just a cliff and that's it. So I don't know <laughs> if that's what it's like or not. We were only like an hour away from the place, but I couldn't convince her. Well, you're only like an hour away from where I live and you've never stepped foot in there. That's true, but there's a good reason for that. Mm, I don't bathe often. Well, hey, I got to commend you. This was really an entertaining story, really fun. I love the honor of being able to play the only American-ish character in the story. <laughs> and Marshall did a great job. It was really fun to listen to. Uh, all of the voices were spot on. Uh, you and I, like we did last week, went on a walk, and we, you, we took your daughter's device and listened to it on our walk. And that was my first exposure to all the cool monsters at once it's it's neat i like it when we have a story that didn't get submitted to us that we sought out because we were particular fans of it uh -huh. and yeah it would be really cool if um, james were to send us another story um i mean have you read anything besides ray gun and all the cool monsters i think i've read a couple other of his stories and he's had what, 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 i'm sorry was ray gun also amusing fun like this or it was less an out-and-out -out comedy, but oh. there was a lot of fun parts to it. And, and it was just, I don't know, it was, it was actually a little different. I mean, it was a love story, as put in the title. And I think uh, Starship Sofa actually podcasted that particular story, and I think you would really enjoy it. And also, okay, our good friend, can we say good friend? Our friend, mediocre friend, Marshall Latham, <laughs> produced our this story. Our evil friend. I don't think anybody from Idaho could be evil. Yeah, you can tell just when you hear him. Marshall Latham is not evil. He produced this for us, even though he's mired in doing his own <laughs> podcast right now. And I, I think I remember he sent me an email and he said, hey, I'm not going to be able to produce any more stories because I got my own podcast and I don't need you guys. And, and I hope you both die. And get, I hope you get cancer and die. And then something happened. Why did he make an exception for this? He really <laughs> well, liked the story? Or did he yeah, I sent him the story. I, I wasn't sure whether he would be able to produce for us anymore or not. So I sent him a story and he said, hey, I don't know if, you can, uh, if you're going to be able to produce for us or not anymore, but here's a story if you want to do this one next. And he wrote me back and he said, you know, I was going to write you back and say, yeah, I, I just can't do it. I, I've got too much to do for my uh, podcast and I, I can't handle it. But I couldn't say no to this story because it was too great. It was too awesome a story, and I had to do it. So, luckily, we were able to squeeze one last production out of Marshall Latham by giving him a good story. We need to watch for another one like this so we can send it to him innocently and be like, Hey, I don't know if you're still interested in producing for us, but here's the best story we've had submitted to us in a year. So we'll see how many more times we can manage to get Marshall to produce for us. He said at one point that he didn't want to give up producing for us. I think he said he was going to take a break, a little break, until he got his feet under him in his own show, and then he would come back to us. So we'll see if we can bring some more blood and sweat out of the poor boy. Well, yeah, he did a good job, and I understand that he's... Got a lot on his plate now. Uh, let's just take a minute to talk about... Journey into... Journey into what? You name it, man. <laughs> journey into the small intestine. Journey into horror. Journey into science fiction. Journey into really, really bad audio dramas from the golden age of radio. <laughs> What a way to promote it. I'm sure he's glad you're talking about it now. Oh, no, no, no. Not, not that the content is bad, just that the audio quality is really, really ah, bad. Does, does that put a Band-Aid on it? Oh, so much better. Marshall's a good guy. Uh, hopefully he has a sense of humor. And <laughs> he's just got a whole... already deleted from his list of contacts. All right. There are only three people left. The, he's got a whole cornucopia of different things that he does on that show. And, and one of them is that he'll do public domain stories, you know, classic literature right. from long ago. Like Poe. Did she sing that song, I'm Gonna Blow You? Away. Ah, you'll, you'll see what you did there. And then he he also do contemporary stuff. He also had Big Ankelvich read a story. Which was a Poe story. Oh, okay. I don't know why I'm still talking. He sent us a, a promo. Do you want to play the promo? Yeah, let's play the promo so you can hear what's in store when you listen to Journey Into... 
Podcast. The unknown. Mystery. Space. Science. Have fun. Adventure. Suspense. Fantasy. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. Journey into the Journey into podcast features replays of old radio shows like X minus one, Escape, Suspense. Lights Out, and many more. Also, about once a month, I sure am trying, it will also feature full cast readings of new and classic stories, as well as new flash fiction. Think of it as a variety pack of audio fiction. It's a happy meal for your ears, or if you don't like happy meals, it's like the toy chest you used to dive into when you went to the dentist as a kid. Come check it out at journeyintopodcast.com blogspot.com So, come with me, and let's journey into space. Or into adventure. Or into fear. Or into mystery. Or into the unknown. Or into... Journey into, like, a shallow grave out in the Nevada desert. The mob dropped off radio executives that didn't play Frank Sinatra albums. Oh, okay. Now I'm starting to get this journey into dot, dot, dot. Do you remember there was a show? In it, Search Of. No, no. It was a terrible show on like the CW or maybe it was before the CW was even the CW. So it may have been like UPN or the oh. WB, one of those two. They, they combined to make that, right? Yeah. They, they made the network with two backs. <laughs> Anyways, they had this show, had Selma Blair in it, and it was called, for the first season, it was called Zoe, Duncan, Jack, and Jane, I think. And at this point, I think in the first season, Selma Blair still wasn't like a big deal. And I think then she did that Cruel Intentions movie. And then the next season, the show was just called Zoe, dot, dot, dot. And they would actually do that in the friggin' promos for the show. They go, Zoe, dot, dot, dot. Of course, the show didn't last because awful. But um, the bar was set so low on those WPN <laughs> shows. And it's just amazing. Well, I mean, that's what we always talked about with a show that's on another kind of network is you didn't have to have millions of viewers. But Wow. <laughs> that got a second season and Firefly didn't. Yeah, sorry. We, we've gotten off topic. One we were thing, talking about Journey yeah. Into... The cool thing about that promo is uh, that rockin' soundtrack theme, mm -hmm. Black Sash. Yeah, that was played by Black Sash. Nice. <laughs> That's a callback, folks. Something you learn when you're a professional like me. Uh, thank you, Marshall, for producing for us one last time. Space. Hey. Science! <laughs> so, I, I don't know what to talk about. I think this is the third story with squatches in it that we've done. One yeah. was the one where all of Earth had been covered with satellite imagery or whatever, oh, except for right. a teeny tiny spot. They're like nanocams or something that were steadily enveloping the entire Earth so every place was under surveillance except for that last bit and it was closing in. And there were monster hunters that went there saying, you know, if there's any unknown animals or, or sasquatches or anything like that they'll be here edge of the map by ian creasy good job uh and then there's the one with that hairy bastard oh that's right man in the who box. had lasers that shot from his eyes to fight the man in the box absence of mind wiping thingies by Derek j goodman you mean wow you really are on the ball sir as far as i know those are our other two squatch stories squatch do you have your squatch watch on no, but one time I'd like to go in the woods with you on a Squatch watch. Yeah. And you know what? I, I don't think I could dislike a person that referred to Bigfoots as Squatches. That's just such a cool, hick 
abbreviation. <clears throat> um, okay. So this is the third one of those. I don't know. Did we ever establish, do you believe that there is a Bigfoot? In this day and age, I figure probably not. If it was an a, an animal, anyways, I don't know what people necessarily say about big. Is he supposed to be a single thing? Is it a bunch of animals? Is it some everlasting being that lives forever and just wanders in the woods and only appears in blurry photographs? I don't know what the folks generally define. Bigfoot as being, if he is actually supposed to be just an animal, I think it's pretty unlikely that it, it is, exists because... Because, like, you can't have sex with Kim Kardashian without it showing up on the internet. Right. And so, yeah, somebody somewhere would have... All right. Yeah, somebody would have seen... There, it wouldn't just be something that nobody has found all this time. I mean, this is like more than 100 years, probably, that people have been saying that there is such a thing. And yet there's nothing to prove it. So unless it was already so, you know, low in population 100 years ago and then somehow was killed off back then, and now just the legends are carrying on, I don't know. Even then, I would assume they'd probably find some kind of a skeleton or something at some point. Uh, The way they come up with dinosaur bones, they probably would have found a Sasquatch skeleton by now, I would think. I don't know. I'm I'm not a big believer in those kind of things, though, I'm afraid. I'm not one of those that believes in cryptozoological animals. So, uh, I guess Ogopogo is out? Oh, no. Ogopogo's real. Oh. Okay. I, I, I did not know that. Okay. Well, now you know. And Manipogo, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing is, you know, I, I, I'm surprised that the uh, guys in the story didn't get this. They were thinking maybe Ogopogo was male and Manipogo was female. It's man Ipogo, so obviously he's the male, right? Life finds a way. <laughs> the running and the screaming. The screaming. Ah, 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 ah. Bomb him. Oh, that was good stuff. <laughs> Whoever they got to play that dude, he should have his own podcast. He shouldn't have to share the spotlight with some doofus. <laughs> Well, you know, I discovered this um, this summer on my trip to uh, Canada. It turns out the Baconator is the official hamburger of the Canadian Football League. That does kind of tie in because this is a story about Canada. And they do mention the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in this story. Bomb them. <laughs> but just blame it on the Blue Bombers. You know, a funny thing, in this story, they, they use the name of the city which uh, it's, it's always a touchy name to say because of what it rhymes oh, with. Don't you it say it. With. We'll but have yeah. to put an explicit warning, <laughs> sir. <laughs> I thought it was so funny that he talks about the city Regina, Saskatchewan, which happens to be the city that, again, Canadian Football League, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders play in this city. I just listened to a book that was by uh, John Grisham, and in this book, uh, one of the characters is offered a contract to play Canadian football with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Cool. And uh, they buy him a round-trip ticket to fly in and meet the folks in Regina. And every time they kept saying the name wrong. and It was like a punch to the stomach each time they said yes. And he touched down in Regina. And I went, oh, no, not Regina. See, so even professionals can mispronounce your hometown. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. You folks out there in Gloucester. <laughs> you folks living in, in Reading in Berkshire, <laughs> you might know all about that. <laughs> I don't know. I've been to Canada enough times to, to have absorbed a lot of that stuff, you know, so I'm, I'm able to avoid uh, some of the common mistakes, I guess, like saying Regina. But nobody wants to say Regina. You look at that word and you can't. Ex- I do. <laughs> you just don't want to say that. I'm sure this, th- there was probably a producer in the reading of that audiobook where uh, the guy was like, uh, either say Regina or say Rajay Either <laughs> order. <laughs> There's. <laughs> oh, that's the worst. I just hate that. That's oh, geez, that word bothers me. Yeah. Like. No other. But yeah, I'm sure there was probably a producer who said, that guy probably went, yes, and he went to Regina, Saskatchewan, and the guy said, no, uh, actually it's pronounced Regina. The guy said, We uh, we won't be able to sell it in Walmart if you call it He said, hey, I'm not saying that. 
I'm sorry. I, I'm married. I'm not saying that. It's Regina. I'm not saying that. I'm sure that's what you probably did. <laughs> but at least in our show, we said Regina. And that's all that matters. Of course. Yeah. Marshall got a, a, an actual Canadian to a, narrate a, this story. A, a rough rider. <laughs> he got a rough rider. He got a Canuck, which is all another sports team up there, interestingly enough. Um, right, so we got some fun. Uh, all this talk of sports is, is alienating me. Wolverine is Canadian. That's true. I, there was the sorbet to cleanse the palate. I just okay. needed to put that forth. <clears throat> Sorry, go on. Tell me more about Wolverine. He says bub. Michigan Wolverines. Oh, see yeah. What I, see back. what I did there? We're back. Good. It's probably alienated most of our audience, too. I don't think we have a huge contingency of uh, sports fans. Maybe we ought to start a thread about that on the uh, forum. Because we have a forum now. No. Yeah, we, we do. And there's uh, it's somewhat vibrant, I would say. There's you usually, are. usually a new post at least every day. Probably closer to 15 or 20 new posts a day. So, you know, it's worth checking out. And you can get on there and you can discuss the story and discuss whatever else. So you have one of those jobs where you're stuck. It's not a cubicle, right? No, it's, but, it's, it's but a But you're booth, stuck in front actually, of a computer called... for hours on end. Uh-huh. And, yeah, I used to have one of those jobs. And, yeah, just the, the, the tradition that you get into of, okay, first I'm going to check this website, and then I'm going to check this website. And then if there's nothing to do after that, I, I always go to this. You know, I'm just amazing, just huge chunks of time get eaten up <laughs> by the Internet. Yeah, I check uh, our forum like a few times a day because, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I have the sites that I go to most often. I click the little down arrow in the uh, at the end of the address bar and uh, down they all come. And I'll go to the first one and the second one. And I think it's worked its way up to the third or fourth uh, option now is our forum. So yeah, I check that out fairly often. I think I may be the dork with the most posts right now. <laughs> but yeah, you can get on there and check that out and uh, contribute. Maybe you could start a thread about if there are people who like sports and what they like. I know that there are some people that like running. I've already confessed to that. Oh, because they'll listen to the show whilst running. Yeah. There are people out there that will run the entire time that one of our shows on. And that's like hour and a half usually at the shortest. I hope that they didn't run during uh, the, the last Popoka story because that was... What, did the, what is it the assholes say? Hella long. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so so get on there. Oh, yeah, one thing I know about sports, if you're not a mank, you're a wank. Really? Yeah, that, that, apparently that is empirical data. That is fact. Wow, that's very interesting. I wish you knew more things about sports so you could dazzle us with more of that knowledge. All right, all right. I try to participate. <laughs> Backhand me. I... Go back to my corner with the ending. friggin' robot. <laughs> back, I, that was not sarcastic in any way. That was purely genuine. No, you haven't been purely <laughs> genuine since your wedding night, man, you sick bastard. <laughs> All right. How long have we been going? It feels short, but... Well, we don't always have to be long. That's what my girlfriend said. <clears throat> we don't always have to go long. That's what I said. Is there any other Canadian things that... Uh, well, there's Alpha Flight. Alpha Flight is the Canadian equivalent of the X-Men. That's true. He goes right along with Wolverine. There's a, an, a member of Alpha Flight that's named Sasquatch, isn't there? Yes. Is he always a Sasquatch? I don't know that much about him. I had his, his figure that one time he sold. A, okay. Not well, he was great. such a heavy figure that yeah. he kind of ate up your profit. And that was in the same wave as another... What was the other heavy figure in that wave? There's like a big fat guy or something. Oh, Maestro was the... Right, right. The one that I call Maestro because I didn't know it was pronounced that way. Was he always oh, a Sasquatch? I don't, I don't know. I, I I think he hulks out and becomes... Does he? Sasquatch. I don't know. He does a kind of a Bruce... Ba Isn't that... He got his powers kind of the same way, though, didn't he? With like gamma rays or... No, he's a mutant. Oh, he's a mutant? I believe all of the Alpha Flight folks are mutant. Well, really? Guardian's not. He just built a suit like Iron Man. It's weird. I, maybe it was just like a uh, 
Canadian Avengers. It's not like Canadian X Men. Yeah, I, that's why I was kind of under that impression. You know, a bunch of heroes from the provinces all got together to be on a team that works for the government, I believe. Cool. I know that Nathan Fillion was a big fan of Alpha Flight. Was he really? He's Canadian. You didn't know that, right? Oh, you you take that back right now. Next, you're going to say William Shatner is Canadian or Michael J. Fox. You take it back. Okay. I take it back. Thank you. Jewel State's Canadian, too. That's oh, interesting. Stop it. You're destroying everything. How many, that. How many members of the cast are? That was shot in Vancouver, too, wasn't it? No, that was L.A. Oh, really? That was Battlestar Galactica that was shot in Vancouver. Ladies and gentlemen, the Parsec-nominated Doonstief team. Any other of the legends that you thought were interesting? Oh, well, the Anne of Green Gables one was way, way funny. See, I should be familiar with all these Canadian things, but like all Americans, I have blinders on when it comes to our, our northern friends, our northern acquaintances. And I don't know, you know, I, I think part of my choice of mispronouncing Ogopogo for my character was that I'd never heard of him. So I was just like, okay. I'll say him the way an American would, since even though I'm playing a Canadian character, he's clearly the substitute for the American. Uh -huh. He wants to bomb everything, so he ah. must be some kind of an American fan, at least. He likes the way Americans do things, at least. That was fun. I liked that your character would mispronounce everything. Loop, Garou, uh, Ogopogo, etc. But yeah, I don't, I, I don't know Ogopogo. It's like a giant uh, sea serpent, right, that lives in the lake. I thought of a nude a Dame Judy Dench, actually, but uh, I often do. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> do you know there's an Ogopogo Island? I didn't either. So is the pond lake? Sorry, the lake where it's located, super super deep, like Loch Ness is. You know, so deep that they're like, well, anything could be down there. Rosie O'Donnell could be down there. <laughs> Let's see what it says about Okanagan Lake. It's like, a large, deep lake, 232 meters deep. It is said by some to be home to its own sea monster, a giant serpent-like creature named Ogopogo. You know, I, I, you didn't ask me if I believed in Bigfoot or true love or... Okay, let me ask you right now. Do you believe in Bigfoot or true love or anything like that? Any of those myths? Well, uh, you know, like the Loch Ness Monster or, or, or a Yeti or a, a good Transformers film, I like the idea that these things could exist. Right. I hate the concept, no matter who it is, of saying that we have all that we need to know. We know everything there is to know. We got all knowledge uh -huh. and all that. I, I just, I mean, maybe it's because I am so dumb. <laughs> I revel in, you know, somebody who is confident enough to admit their own ignorance, you know, because not a day goes by that I'm not wrong about something. Or like I said, last week or two weeks ago, every Monday I learned something new uh -huh. when we we're hanging out. I don't know everything about everything. Uh, I, I know those fucking Transformers movies are giant logs of shit. So hard that, you know, you can't get them out in one squeeze. It's the kind where you just like sweat. It's flop sweat. It's wow. rolling down. <laughs> you got a vein right here in your forehead that you think may pop before this thing exits uh, your body. Is this really what you guys want to be talking about tonight? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll put that in the outtakes. Hey, R.O.T., -T, can you cut that out and put that in the outtakes? Because, yeah, that is offensive. Okay. Whatever you say, Rish Outfield. Wow. I'm here to make you happy. Okay, well, I'll talk to you in the alley behind the building afterward. Um, like a good Transformers film, I like revel in my own ignorance. And, and, and so, I don't know, it sort of gives me some kind of solace to think that there could be ghosts, that there could be, you know, someone out there for everybody. There could be a, a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. There could be a remake that's better than the original film. These things, they're hard, they're hard to grasp and they're hard to identify. I just, and that story, the one that you mentioned before that you knew the name of, that Ian Creasy wrote. Edge of the map. There is something so depressing about the thought that, you know, we know it all or we've done it all or we've seen it all. You know, a person that's experienced it all. When Alexander looked over the breadth of his domain... He wept, for there were no new worlds to conquer. 
You know what I mean? The, that to me kind of takes away the magic of life. And it seems to me that the point of life, the point of continuing is, is, is something new over the horizon is that there's always more to do, more people to see, more ladies to bed, more adventures to have, more foods to try, more just around the river bend. Okay. That, that, that's <laughs> true to no singing. Oh, see announcer, man, you don't come screaming about singing when it's him. Uh, I, I don't know what the point of life is, honestly, mm -hmm. but if there is a point to life, maybe it is to experience, to grow, to, to expand your knowledge, to, to shoot a lot of bad guys and bed a lot of like Soviet double agent women. Something like that. So, uh, I, I just, yeah, the thought of the it being all, is this all there is, you know, kind of thing that really scares and depresses me. You yeah. like the idea that there are monsters possibly out there still that we don't know about. Maybe there's a Mongolian death worm or a chupacabra or a... A brain-eating Nandi bear. Right, or Alf or something out there. Just, just come back in pog form. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that ain't funny, man. Pog's the wave of the future. I, I, when you hear old stories about sailors saying, you know, here there be dragons... Or, or, you know, you can't sail too far because you'll go off the edge of the map. Eh, no, good. look at you. Now you know the title of the story. Or mistaking manatees for mermaids or, or whatever it or, is. Or Manitoba. It's e Oh, okay. <laughs> That's one callback too many, sir. You've exceeded your <laughs> limit. You're going to have to throw one back. It's easy to dismiss them and say, oh, you know, the ignorance of people past and all that. But, boy, there, there's something romantic about that, of about going someplace where no man has gone before. Yeah. At, you know, a final frontier, if you will. Yeah, I just, I, I hate the idea that one day we would reach the edge of the universe. Why does God need a starship? That, uh, that we would reach the barrier of or the limit of what mankind can learn. So, yes, just the idea of holding out the possibility that there are monsters, the possibility that there could still be plesiosaurs in Scotland or the, what was the fish that was discovered just a few years ago that had been extinct for millions of right, years, the yeah, seafloracamp or something like that. It's something or other. It, the Indomitian Sioux. Right. That's the name of what it was. And they found that, and suddenly, all of the science books had to be amended. You know what I mean? I just, I, that is such a cool thing. Something that rocks everybody's understanding and reminds us that, hey, maybe we're not so smart as we pretended to be, or as we assumed we were. Eh, I don't know. That's just me. Maybe other people feel the complete opposite, and they will not stop ever until you are dead. Oh, no, wrong movie. They will not stop until the earth has been covered with nano cameras until everything has been quantified and sampled and the rainforest has been burned to the ground and it's like there is no cure for cancer there or at least until all are one till all are one till, till all are one till michael bay no longer is in charge of the transformers franchise uh, maybe on that note, we should should quit. For a second there, this looked like it was going to be a short episode. And then I had to open my mouth. If you don't turn it off right now, I'm going to ask you what Dune Steve means. Oh, uh, see you later, folks. Good night. Rish, you've become a half-human, half-monster abomination. The good news is that you're that much closer to becoming a full-fledged human being. The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can share the show with whomever you'd like, but you cannot charge for it or alter the show. Please donate, folks. It'll help us pay our authors. And isn't that what it's all about? Good night, guys. Take two. Here, you get to say one of my favorite words. Fake.
fairies. <coughs> Don't worry about the fairies. <coughs> I. Wait, in Canada they say, A. How dare you? <laughs> Loop guru! Is this a funny story? No. Doesn't this seem totally straightforward to you? This is too in it's uh, very, inside it's very, baseball. It's very Canadian. I wonder how many folks will find it funny. Like the Maple Leafs thing, the Lugaroo attacked him because he's wearing Maple Leafs hat. Will people realize that it's the, well, the uh, Toronto versus Montreal thing? The Sasquatches can play hockey, and those Wendigos are probably tremendous skiers. Am I playing this guy too American? <laughs> you might be, I don't know. Then blame it on the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. <laughs> You don't know who the Winnipeg Inside baseball Bombers again. are, do you? Why would I? Well, don't you follow Canadian football? No, oh, I was having sex in high school. Doesn't everybody follow Canadian football? It's the biggest football in Canada. Canadian football is the biggest football in Canada? <laughs> yeah. I, I still, I disagree. I'll bet American football is bigger than Canadian. <laughs> but it's not in Canada, so there. <laughs> One observer. More people like the... Uh, Minnesota Vikings in Canada than like the, <laughs> the Winnipeg more people are fans of the Minnesota Vikings than the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in Winnipeg. Well, I don't know about <laughs> Winnipeg, but Oh, Anne of Green Gables. You're friggin' kidding me. <laughs> Anne didn't fear because she was a monster. <clears throat> huh. So why haven't they shown up in Washington State? Or Oregon or California? Do you want to say Oregon? No. Please. Never. As a favor to me? I shan't. Why? Because. Or Oregon. Or Oregon. <laughs> or Oregon. Or California. Or California. Maybe because the U.S. Air Force isn't so stingy with bombs. Maybe it's because the Rockies aren't in California. Oh. How dare you? California is everything. None of you would be alive if it went by my California. The blank side. But all three of us have to agree that the bomb is necessary. Yes! I'll call Comox and tell him to put our bomb out of mothballs. Pull. Co it... Say Comox. All right. I'll call Comox and tell him to pull our bomb out of mothballs. I'll call Comox and tell him to pull our bomb out of mothballs. <laughs> I can't say it right. <laughs> Pretty funny. He's sort of become Arlie Ermy now, hasn't he? If I had the slightest idea who that was, I might agree with you. Just any time you hear a military character in a oh, movie or a cartoon, like he was the army guy the on from, Toy Story. That's the, the dude from Full Metal, uh, Jacket, Full Metal Jacket. The guy that said Jane that Rotten Crotch said that word that you and I hate so much. Jack wagon. Yeah. Oh. Jack wagon. Is it Comox? Does anybody know what Canadians military establishment is called? I mean Canadians know that. Come on. Those people can handle low temperatures. They just lock themselves inside and listen to Shania Twain albums. It's sounding a little bit of the Russian in here. Those people can handle low temperatures. They just know. Huh? Oh, shut up, cat. <laughs> My God. Does our Air Force even have bombers? Or are you just going to toss sticks of dynamite out of a Hercules? That sounds like your mother was a hamster. Anyway. If we're sure these monsters are heading for Winnipeg, we need to plan for what. Maybe those goths who were bitten by the Lugaroo now turn into wolves on full moon nights. Or maybe those are all just myths. Hmm. Big and rich keep 
picking these stories that just get to me, you know? When Uncle Pogo had to say goodbye. That was really good. If you can't see it right now, I'm fanning my eyes. Well, thank you for listening to this podcast. Just around the river bend. That's weird because I was tempted to say that as well. I wait to see. Starship Sofa still exist? They do. Damn. I think they were nominated for a Hugo again this year, but they didn't win this time. Oh, no, I think they were only... You're right. Were they nominated they two were, years in a row? They were nominated again, yeah. Bastards. This time, uh, somebody else won, though. Wait, when did they announce the Hugos? Over the weekend? Saturday, yeah. Well, I didn't check that out. Did Doctor Who win? Yeah, it was, wasn't was all the friggin' nominations for Doctor Who, though. Well, there was Fuck Me Ray Bradbury. Yeah, somebody wrote that in there thing where they were talking about the winners of the Hugos and they said boy I'm glad that this one won I don't know if it was the best or not I just didn't want that F me Ray Bradbury story to win because it didn't deserve it it was absolute shit dude we didn't we listen to it together or no Jeff sent it to me or something I was like don't send me this man send me porn but don't send me this it turned into a love story for Canada and for monsters Two of my favorite things in the world. So is Canada uh, one of your favorite things in the world, too? No. <laughs> That's surprising. I, I thought I was going to get a different answer from you. <laughs> yeah, we'll put that in the outtakes, folks. I think I may have even, I think Starship Sofa. Ooh, you. I don't think you could hear that. Could you? I think he said he was going to take a break, a little break, until he got his feet under him in his own show, and then he would come back to us. I remember when your wife said she wanted to take a break, and a couple months later, black baby. Jeez. <laughs> oh, I'll cut that out. Don't worry. Okay, now you need to say a journey into something wildly inappropriate. Go. Journey into a glory hole, a oh. man's oh. restroom truck stop. Well, that was more wildly inappropriate than I expected possible. Oh, okay. uh. Jeez. <laughs> How you like them apples, Chingasso? Chunky. 40 to 50 foot long sea serpent. A guy sold footage of a beaver to Unsolved Mysteries claiming it to be an Okafono. <laughs> yeah. That was... Fairly lame. No, I thought that's interesting. Let's look at the bottom and see if there's any links of like photographs of Ogopogo. Okay, well, let's look at the bottom. There, we don't have any photographs. We have this. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.